Hello and welcome to the third video in this series. This one's all about the Russian Revolution. So here's the big picture. Tsarist Russia, meaning Russia led by its absolute monarch, the Tsar, entered World War I as an absolute monarchy with sharp class divisions between the nobility and the peasants. The grievances or complaints of workers and peasants were not resolved by the Tsar. So he didn't, didn't really do a good job. Inadequate administration in World War I led to revolution and an unsuccessful provisional government. So, and that means a government that was put in place in the meantime while you were trying to set up a permanent government solution. A second revolution by the Bolsheviks created the communist state that eventually became the USSR. In these notes, you'll see connections back to the Industrial Revolution as Russia's industrialized population and the effects of horrible industrial warfare uh, caused people to want to get out of World War I and eventually overthrow the Tsar and put in some new kind of government that will respond more readily to the people's demands. Um, then when we learn about capitalism, socialism, and communism, this uh, USSR, the country that will eventually be in place after the revolutions, is the one that came to symbolize basically all of communism and socialist ideals. So that'll be important. And then also nationalism, as the nationalist feelings of the Russian people led them to participate in World War I, at least at first, in large numbers. But then over time, even sort of blind nationalism wasn't able to keep them um, unaware of the devastation that was occurring and also uh, wasn't enough to keep the Tsar in power. So you can see that nationalism sometimes supports leaders, but really it just seems to support uh, nations as a, as a social group, which is interesting. Here are the causes of the revolution. I'm going to list them here, and then I'm going to talk about each of them individually. So let's look at the uh, defeat in war with Japan first. The Russo-Japanese War, which was in 1905, was between Japan and Russia. Because remember, Russia extends all the way across Asia, and Russia wanted uh, ports over on that side of the world that weren't locked up in ice all the time. And Japan had been expanding to obtain more natural resources during this time, so they poof, butted heads. You can see here, this is a three-panel painting um, in the Japanese style of the Japanese troops with their flag rushing up on the Russians with their flag. And in this war, Russia lost, and it was kind of surprising. Uh, that is not what the rest of the world expected to happen, or at least not for Russia to lose as clearly as it did. Um, so Japan came out of that looking really good, uh, and Russia was humiliated, especially the Tsar, who had put a lot of his own personal weight behind that war. There were a lot of peasants in Russia. Russia was a nation that had only a couple of decades before gotten rid of what was basically slavery of the average people who lived and worked on the lands, um, but the landowners still had an enormous amount of money and control over the people, so most people were very, very poor. Um, and as you can see over here, that led to, if there were times where food was scarce, there were bread riots, people just rioting to try and get what they need to keep their families alive. And bread riots are one of the things that helped cause some of these early revolutionary movements. Um, oh, and one thing I want to say about this is, as you can see, it's mostly women. So some of the interesting participation of women during this time period um, was in <laughs> starting revolutions in Russia, which is fascinating. In World War I, let's take a look at the casualties. So Eastern Front, so that was where Russia was fighting Austria, Hungary, and Germany. Um, the casualties amounted to about 14 million, which is a lot. And Russian casualties made up 74% of that. 74% as compared to only 26% of the Central Powers. So Russia had an enormous millions and millions and millions of people dying, getting injured, and getting captured, which was very upsetting to all of the people who lived in Russia, whose family members were involved. Tsar Nicholas II also was a pretty poor leader. Whenever you see him, especially in cartoons, you will see this excellent mustache and beard combo he has going on, and that's a traditional Russian hat. Um, but this political cartoon right here is a reference to uh, not his poor leadership during World War I, but his poor leadership before that. Um, in 1905, there was a revolution that is not the one we're talking about, which starts in uh, 1918, 1917. Um, but this one in 1905 was started because there were people protesting outside of the Winter Palace, where you see right there, um, on what would later be called Bloody Sunday. And that's because Tsar Nicholas II um, wasn't able to uh, meet any of the demands of the people there or work with them or any of their leaders, and eventually the, the guards fired on the people, actually firing into a crowd of unarmed protesters. 
So as a result, Tsar Nicholas II gets kicked out, especially because after uh, in World War One he went out to try and lead troops himself, and that made him look really bad because Russia was doing really poorly. So eventually, there's another government that crops up after the revolution has taken place, and that's led by Alexander Kerensky. And Alexander Kerensky was the side of the Russian Revolution that other people in Europe felt somewhat comfortable with, or at least the United States did. Um, but then there was a group called the Bolsheviks, who were more radical revolutionaries, uh, who followed the communist and socialist viewpoints. And, you know, in this time period, Alexander Kerensky and his government were beaten out by the Bolsheviks, who, in, you know, had a second revolutionary phase where they promised peace and bread and land, which was far more appealing. So Vladimir Lenin promising peace and bread and land, far more uh, appealing that Alexander Kerensky, who kept Russia in World War One, so Tsar Nicholas II falls because of the participation in World War One, largely, and then Alexander Kerensky comes in and decides, no, we need to like keep, let's keep in the war because we want to make sure we don't lose all this territory because it looks like we might hold out and we might win, which he wasn't totally wrong, but in the time, the people in Russia could not see past their need for, you know, food to eat and a change in their economic condition. So Vladimir Lenin, leader of the Bolshevik Revolution, came into power. And then later, after Vladimir Lenin's death, Joseph Stalin comes into power. And Joseph Stalin is who will follow through much of the interwar period. But Lenin, before he died, had some interesting ideas. So they followed communist ideals and uh, instituted uh, you know, systems of redistribution and socialism, but uh, he had some views on how to get there effectively, how to go from a czarist Russia to a communist utopia. And he thought that agriculture, retail, and small manufacturing shouldn't be under government control, at least for now. That you should have um, heavy industry, banking, and foreign trade under government control, because those are the most dangerous ones to leave in the control of powerful economic actors like businessmen. But you can leave these smaller ones not under government control, and that would be more effective, because they're run on a day-to-day -day basis by the little people. Um, and also, he reintroduced money. And that helped the Russian economy uh, keep from crashing after uh, World War I, or at least keep from crashing any worse. But that's all for this video.